And we're going to get started here. We just started the official recording. Welcome. So before we get started, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what First Tuesdays is about. And first of all, before we do that, if you have any problems hearing or seeing the screens, um, please let Jeremy know. I'll bring up the slide in a moment with his information. And with me today is Carolyn, who will be introducing our speaker in a few minutes. And then I'm Jennifer, and we're both the Washington State Library and Library Development. And our technical support today is Jeremy Stroud. And you can see his email and phone number there. So you may want to take a, a moment to jot it down if you think that you might need to give a shout out to Jeremy. You can also send a message in the chat box to Jeremy, and he'll be happy to help you with any sound or other issues you may be experiencing in this um, online virtual environment. First Tuesdays is brought to you by the Washington State Library and is part of our Institute of Museum and Library Services programming. And now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Carolyn to introduce Deborah. Oh, first of all, actually, please take a moment. Most of you have done this. But type in chat where you are from, uh, what library and state city you are from. And that way, we will have a good uh, record of who attended today. Thank you. And now, Carolyn. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. What, uh, we are very privileged to have with us Deborah Westward. She has been with uh, King County Library System for about four, uh, five years. And before that, she spent a considerable amount of time with the Seattle Public Library. And when she was there, she really uh, developed a variety of skills. She was a subject specialist, um, a librarian. She was a library reference paraprofessional, a volunteer coordinator, a literacy outreach coordinator, and a branch manager. So about five years ago, she did join uh, King County, where she is a cluster manager or a regional manager of the Bellevue branches of the King County Library Services uh, system. She also serves as a staff trainer. And in that position, she has developed and taught classes on coping with change in the workplace, leaving others through change and burnout on the job. And we're very thankful that she was willing to share her expertise with us. Um, this was a presentation that she previously did at the Washington, uh, the Washington Library Association mm -hmm. Annual Conference. And so we're, willing that, um, we're thankful that she was willing to uh, share it with us and kind of modify it because it's a little different on an uh, in online environment. And we appreciate the extra work she did to share that with us. And I noticed that quite a few other people are joining um, the uh, joining us now, people do kind of come in, so we'll give just a moment. And um, we are going to ask folks to thank you for joining us. And um, I imagine we need you to type in where you're from to keep our records good, uh, to type us where you're uh, joining from. So if you would please do that, we will get started in just a moment. And I will be monitoring the chat today. And so as Deborah does her presentation, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. And I will collect them. And then we will, um, we will um, ask them to Jennifer at the very end of the session. So uh, we appreciate that. And um, any other things, uh, Jennifer, that you'd like to share with us before we get started with Deborah? No, I think we're ready to turn it over to Deborah. OK, well, Deborah, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, let me just make sure that, because I can't see you, let me just make sure that you can hear me. Let's put a check in the box. If you can, use that little check thing if you can hear her. So please, let's do that. Let's click on check. Yes, if we can hear her. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us this morning um, from lots of places uh, from all across the country. Um, and I appreciate you being here. I think that's a testament to the general level of interest in this topic. Um, I hope it's not a statement about how pervasive burnout may be in our, in our profession. Um, I hope that it's a statement about how people are aware of it and want to make sure that they don't go down that path. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, so our topic today is uh, what I call burnout, avoiding the flames, identifying, preventing, and recovering from burnout. Um, here's a picture of me on a very good day. Uh, and my contact information if you would like to follow up at all. 
Um, I think many of us in our careers in libraries, we've been in a conversation with someone and they said, oh, what do you do? And we say, oh, I work in a library. And their response is, oh, you work in a library, that must be nice. And yes, it is. Most of us, we love our jobs, we love working with the patrons. And I think that there are other aspects to our jobs that many people don't understand. Um, we work in very high public contact jobs. Uh, we deal with patrons who have very real needs. Um, we work in a time of changing roles for libraries and really a changing technological landscape. And I think most of us are dealing with pressure to do more with fewer resources. Many of us have, are working with staff who have worked in libraries for a very long time. Um, and we have many committed staff who really want to do it all, but we may not have the time or the resources to do that. Um, we also work in an environment, the environment around us, where people may have uncertainty at home. Um, they're dealing with uh, perhaps someone in their family is unemployed. There's pressure on them from the outside. Uh, many of our patrons are dealing with uh, unemployment, homelessness. And so we are seeing great societal needs. And now some of our people, some of our staff, just bounce along and do just great with this. Um, they remain resilient. They don't have a problem with it. But others start to fade. Um, they, they start to feel less enthusiasm for their job. And we might ask, well, why does that happen? Why some and not others? And let's see, perhaps there are some ways in our conversation today, maybe we can improve those, those proportions. Maybe we can help prevent burnout in some. Uh, if we feel it coming for ourselves, we can stave it off with a few little strategic moves. What we're going to talk about today is, this is just a quick summary of what we'll cover. Uh, we're just going to look quickly at the differences between burnout and stress, because they are a little different. Uh, we're going to talk about signs and symptoms of burnout and what contributes to it. And then what can you do to prevent it and what can you do to recover for yourself or help someone else recover? Uh, an easy way to summarize that is actually the three R's, recognize, resilience, and reverse. Burnout has lots of names. Uh, we will hear it referred to as occupational stress, professional stress syndrome, vital exhaustion, compassion fatigue, karaoshi. Uh, karaoshi is a Japanese term meaning death by overwork. Um, and sometimes we will hear burnout referred to as secondary traumatic stress disorder. I'm going to differentiate about that in a little bit. But burnout is something that we see in many, many different occupations. If you Google burnout, you will find articles about burnout in priests, burnout among nurses, among physicians, among social workers, among law enforcement personnel, among lawyers, among teachers. And we also experience among librarians and library staff. The thing that all of these professions have in common is they are high public contact positions. They tend to be people who are very uh, strongly motivated to work with people people who are very involved in their work. And for many of the people involved in these professions, work is one of the ways that you derive uh, satisfaction in your life. Um, you're making a difference in the world. And it's your, your work is a source of your identity. I'm going to give you a working definition of burnout. Um, Christina Maslach and Susan Jackson are oft quoted researchers on the topic of burnout. They did some, uh, their article that's uh, listed here is, um, if you, again, if you Google burnout, they're going to come up on your first page. And what they're, this is a working definition that they provided and I've highlighted I, the terms that I think are really important, um, that it's in a sense of emotional exhaustion and an accompanying cynicism that occurs among people who do people work of some kind. So we don't tend to see burnout in folks who work with things. We tend to see burnout in folks who work with people. Let's talk just a little briefly about the difference between stress and burnout. Stress is characterized by, stress is actually a it's a situation about too much. There's too much to do. There's too much to say. There's too much pressure. There's too much adrenaline. 
burnout is more about not enough, not enough energy to do it. There's just not enough gas in the tank, not enough resources. Um, there is a sense, can be a sense, everything is blunted. The response, rather than being um, urgent and hyperactive, is to pull back, is to slow down. Things are dampened. Um, stress has tremendous physical uh, a physical effect. Stress is bad for your heart, it's bad for your digestive tract, it's bad for your immune system, it's bad for your sleep cycles. Stress contributes to all kinds of physical ailments. Burnout is generally characterized as doing damage to your heart, your soul. Um, stress may kill you prematurely because it's so hard on your body. Burnout may just feel you may, may make you feel like just life is not worth living. Okay. Now that's a really upbeat way to look at it. But I think we can also summarize it just in this in this cartoon, which comes from a website called My Burnout Thing. On the left side we have stressed Eric whose hair is back, whose eyes are big, who's looking stressed out. But on the right we have burnt out Eric who Eric was just too exhausted to show up for the picture. And that's kind of burnout in a nutshell. Now, burnout does not happen overnight. Um, we don't tend to have spontaneous acts of burnout. There are situations where um, people have an experience where they just feel like they just can't go on. Um, that's more along the lines of post-traumatic stress disorder. When we think about the classical symptoms and signs of burnout, it's more a gradual uh, accumulation of things. But there are warning signals, and they occur really within three realms, within the physical or the body, the mental or the mind or emotions, um, and then observable behaviors. Now, the physical signs and symptoms, and I, I you know, the fact that you're here at this webinar tells me that you're probably familiar with some of these things. Um, perhaps you have felt them yourself. Perhaps you've observed them in others. But the physical signs and symptoms are that just general sense of exhaustion all the time. You just don't have the energy to do it. Um, sometimes this manifests itself in physically in the immune system suffers. Um, so people tend to get more colds, uh, have frequent headaches, um, free muscle aches and pains. Your body just doesn't stand up to the stresses of daily life or you just don't feel like soldiering on when you don't feel like you're at 100%. Sometimes it manifests itself in changes in appetite or in sleep habits. Um, too tired to eat, just no energy to do those kinds of things. Too tired to get up to go to bed. There's a little vicious cycle in that. And these physical signs and symptoms may be observable in uh, one's body, slumped shoulders, eyes down, slowed responses. Now there can be other reasons for these same physical signs and symptoms. You know, people who have chronic illnesses or people who are naturally have a lower immune system. I'm not saying that these physical signs and symptoms are surefire mean that somebody's burned out. That's not the case. But combined with some of these other things we're going to talk about, Sometimes that's an indicator. Within yourself or within the person you may uh, experience or see signs of these kinds of emotional symptoms or these emotional indicators. A sense of detachment. Uh, emotions are blunted. There's just not the spark there. Uh, sometimes the person will turn their feelings in on themselves and they will indicate that they have their sense of self-worth. Self-worth has uh, deteriorated as a sense of helplessness or a sense of self-blame. And sometimes that self-blame manifests itself as, oh, there's so, there's so much to do. If I just worked harder, if I just came in earlier, if I just ha tried harder, I could do this, except that that doesn't tend to change things. And so there's a cycle of blame that can happen. The person may um, express just a sense of inner emptiness, a blahness. There's just no spark, no get up and go. It's, it's hard to see what's the point, why should I do this? Or it manif may manifest itself as kind of those classic symptoms of depression that we think of. There's often also just 
a loss of satisfaction in the work, a loss of satisfaction with life in general, and an increasingly cynical or negative view of things. Um, why should I try? Nothing's going to get any better. Um, it's just not worth it. And so when there's a persistent pattern of this, that can be a warning sign. Now, the previous two things we've talked about, uh, physical signs, you can see, you may be able to observe those. Emotional signs and symptoms, it's hard to see. You know, you can't see inside a person's heart and soul, so you can't know what they're feeling, but you can observe their behavior. And some of the behavioral signs that we sometimes see, a person tends to withdraw or isolate themselves. Uh, you may have someone who used to be one of your top performers, used to be really um, active and vital, but they're taking, it's taking a lot longer for them to get things done. Sometimes people self-medicate. They'll use food or drugs or alcohol to help themselves cope, uh, to help themselves feel better, to help themselves get through the day. You may have, uh, you may notice people who previously have always been kind of calm and moderate, and but they're now expressing um, you know, fits of temper or um, outbursts and express, take, just taking out their frustration on others. Um, and in the workplace, we certainly see it as people skipping work, coming in late, leaving early, um, and part of that stems from the sense that there's nothing I can do, so why should I bother? Um, you know, people are no longer bringing you their A game because they just can't find it anymore. Ironically, one of the things that people often uh, say to, as a way to respond to uh, burnout is to call in your support system, you know, seek out people who help you uh, recharge and help, help you feel revitalized. But when one of the behaviors is withdrawal or isolation, those two things are in conflict with each other. Now, for you, um, for you all, there is I've, I've included a burnout assessment sheet that should be popping up here in the webinar at some point, and it's something that you'll be able to print out and actually look at for yourself, figure out where you are. Um, on the burnout spectrum. This is just a handy tool. It's not a formal diagnostic tool. Um, it can help you identify emerging issues for yourself. It's also, uh, oh, there it is. Um, it's also something that uh, lists a number of behaviors, and it's helpful, maybe helpful for you to read and just note for yourself or um, if you're coaching or counseling someone else. And this um, assessment, this PDF, will be included in the webinar when it's archived, so it'll still be available to you. And it's a series of 16 questions that asks you what your state is physically, emotionally, behaviorally, and asks you to rate it as, I feel this way, not at all, rarely, sometimes, often, very often. You total those up, each one of them's given a weight factor, and then you get to compare it on a scale. There are a lot of factors that contribute to burnout. As I said, it's not something that tends to just leap up on you one day. It tends to be something that is accumulative, um, builds up over time. And as we look at why do some people burn out and others don't? We have some folks who've worked in this field or folks who've been nurses or ministers or social workers for decades who still seem resilient. And yet there are others who are new to the professions and they don't last very long. There are a number of factors that, uh, that influence that. Part of it has to do with your work environment. Part of it has to do with your lifestyle. And part of it just has to do with your own personality and how you're wired to deal with the world. Uh, each person has their own way of moving through life. Everybody has their own perspective and attitude. And some keep a person buoyed up and allow them to rebound from these, any disappointments or setbacks. Um, others leave people more vulnerable to perhaps persistent disappointment. If you know about these factors, it might help you create safeguards. And some of these, if any of you are supervisors, um, they may be within your realm of influence. Some of them are uh, related more to how the person 
how the person is wired, how they operate, and it may not be the kind of thing that you can really coach someone on, um, but there may be, if you can see how it manifests itself in the workplace, there may be ways for you to address it. We're going to work through this chart clockwise. And I'd like to ask you for your input, for your thoughts about um, what some of these factors are. If you think about work-related factors that might contribute to burnout, what kinds of things do you think um, help send people down that road? What are the work-related factors that contribute to burnout? And you can go ahead and type your thoughts in the chat box if you have any, if you have any thoughts on that. Work-related factors that contribute to burnout. Carolyn has said an inability to control what happens to you in your job. And Laura is saying being understaffed, mm -hmm. unresolved stress. Difficulty delegating what can be delegated. Are there other thoughts? Frequent interruptions that are not work-related. Mm -hmm. Are there other contributing factors? Um, what else someone stresses people out? Someone contributed poor communication, Workload. not being heard. Ah, poor communication, not being heard. Excellent. Just working with the public. And I think that there's kind of an unrelenting uh, a, the sense of emptying the ocean with a teacup, that the work never stops. Well, let's look at some of the well, workplace drama and passive-aggressive coworkers. Okay. Uh, conflicting agendas. Conflicting uh, agendas. Yeah, when the management tell you one thing and the boss tells you something mm -hmm. else. Let's look at some of these. I mean, some of these are things that are the ones that you have, have talked about already. Work-related factors, feeling like you have little or no, little or no control over your work. Um, when in the, as somebody mentioned, working with the public, or also that sense of, as I said, emptying the ocean with a teacup, it's, it just never stops. And I have very little control over it, and it just keeps coming at me. Having unclear or overly demanding job expectations, when you are asked, when you, when you feel like you're being asked to move mountains every day and don't have the resources um, to help you do that. Lack of recognition or rewards for doing your work for doing good work, you're slogging along in the trenches every day and not feeling like you're really getting rewards for that. Now, there are some folks who will say, well, you get a paycheck, don't you? But there are other ways that people um, seek out and, and other kinds of rewards that people appreciate. Work that's monotonous or unchallenging can also contribute to that. And working in a chaotic or high-pressure environment. And I think that a lot of that, that working in a chaotic or high-pressure environment can include workplace drama, um, can include conflicting agendas, can include, uh, there was a statement that somebody made earlier about frequent interruptions that are not work-related, when you just can't get in your rhythm where you're always kind of um, set off. There is uh, something called the job demand control theory that you can go ahead and, and take a look at if you like, if you Google it. What it does is it creates an X and a Y axis of jobs that have low and high pressure on the job contrasted with low and high levels of control over what you do. And you may have people who work in a job that's not, you know, the low pressure, not a lot of pressure, and not a lot of control. But, and that tends to be the kind of environment where people might be bored, but they tend not to burn out. And those would be positions where you don't have a lot of resources or latitude, but you also don't have a lot of stress or responsibility. And, um, you know, an example of that might be, oh, the security guard who works at the office building at night who monitors the CCTV system, and when there's a problem, they call the police. So they're not actually the one responding. Um, they're just kind of keeping an eye on things, but they don't actually have to be responsible for that. And you have situations where you have... Um, high control and low demand, and that's somebody who has a lot of resources and the skills to deal with the situation, um, but they don't actually have to do that very often. And I think a classic example of that might be uh, perhaps a teacher who's teaching a class that she's taught a hundred times before. Has it down pat, it's pretty smooth sailing. You have positions that are high control, 
it's got a lot of resources, you have a lot of control over the situation, and high demand. And an example of that might be the CEO of a thriving company. Uh, many professional occupations um, fit into that role. And, but where you tend to, tend to have burnout is when you're into that section of the quadrant that's low control, you don't have a lot of say over what happens, you may not have the resources uh, to deal with it, and high demand. There's a lot you have to do. So you have to do a lot, but you don't have a lot to do it with. And um, kind of a, an example of that might be a teacher with inadequate supplies or staffing, a factory worker who works at an assembly line where they have no control over the speed of it, military commander with no, with not, without adequate troops or equipment, or library staff working in an environment where we're, const where we're asked to do a lot more, but we don't have additional resources. Um, and Jerry has mentioned trying to keep up with technology. I think that's probably another one, the sense of, I only have so much time. Uh, for some of us at certain points in our life, we may feel, I'm not sure I can keep up with a whole new version of technology. I feel like my technology buffer is full, and yet, here we go. Here's a whole nother, um, a whole nother type of technology. If you've been paying any attention to the reports from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, they're talking about all these new things that are coming along. And I look at it and think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to learn how to use some of those things. And I will confess, I feel it's a little daunting to think of that. Now, for some of these things, they are within your control. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as an employee, some of these factors are within your control. Um, as a manager, some of them may be within your control. Um, as an employee, you may be in a position, if you are working in an environment where the expectations of the job are unclear, you may be able to seek clarification. Now, for some of us who are uh, middle managers, there, you may have a sense of um, being stuck. Um, I, I don't have the resources. I've asked for clarification, but I didn't get it. But people are asking me for clarification. They're asking me for a clearer direction. That's a difficult position to be in. Um, I wish I had a magic bullet for that. Um, lack of recognition. Um, as a manager, you may be in a position, a manager or a supervisor, you may be in a position to provide that um, in small ways. When there are unclear or overly demanding expectations, again, as a staff member, asking for clarification um, can be a way to help alleviate some of that. As a manager or a supervisor, you may be able to have some influence over that by making clear that the expectations you put out are clear, are reasonable. You may be able to, may be able to help me mediate that. Doing work that's monotonous or unchallenging as an employee, are you in a position to ask to change some things up, swap some things out, have, ask for a little variety? As a manager or a supervisor or someone who delegates those or assigns those tasks, are you in a position to swap some things up for people, provide variety to people? When you're working in a chaotic or a high pressure environment, there may be some ways that as a supervisor, um, can you carve out time so that you are not interrupted? Uh, can you do some things to help reduce the amount of chaos in your environment for yourself and for your employees? Those may be ways that you can help to mediate some of those. Okay. Let's move on to lifestyle factors. There are ways that we conduct our lives that might help contribute to burnout. Again, I'll ask you for your ideas. What are some of the ways that we live our lives outside of the workplace, where we, things that we do, uh, behavior patterns that we have, what are some things that folks do that might contribute to burnout? My mother used to have an expression about uh, burning the candle at both ends. Kate's mentioning overcommitting ourselves. Marilee's talking about not getting enough rest. Poor health habits. Are there other things? Lack of exercise. Taking work home. 
<laughs> putting every, everyone else first. I'm laughing because, boy, you guys are coming up with these examples really quickly. Hmm. Saying no without guilt. Carrie's offered that. Um, I think saying no without guilt may be one of those things that uh, helps to stave off burnout. Uh, it's the saying no with guilt, I think, that contributes to it. Any other last thoughts on that? Well, let's look at some of them. That lack of a work-life balance is very important. If, there, um, if in your life in general you never uh, leave work, you take work home with you, um, you never unplug, uh, trying to be too many things to too many people, um, not knowing how to say no, um, taking on too much, unbalanced sleep or nutritional habits, and I was trying to be really uh, uh, neutral in how I phrased this rather than saying bad sleep habits or eating junk food, but unbalanced sleep or nutritional habits where you're not getting enough sleep and you're not feeding the machine, you're not giving yourself appropriate uh, nutrition. Um, and lack of close supportive relationships, uh, not having any support system around you can certainly be one of the things that contributes to that because you don't have any, if you don't have anybody around you who encourages you to have some downtime, who distracts you, who brings joy into your life, who helps you um, find, find the joy in your life, um, that can be the kind of thing that really exacerbates burnout. Also, a chaotic home life. Um, you know, strong external demands from family circumstances. And these, some of these are things that are certainly beyond our control. Some of us have um, aging parents at home. We may have, uh, uh, there may be illness in our family. We may have an unemployed spouse or there may be family crises going on. And these are the kinds of things where your energy is now divided. And if you're trying to maintain a work-life balance where work is the major source of your stress and you're trying to go home, which would be the place where you are restored and refreshed, but when you're at home, that's not actually happening, you don't ever have a chance to recharge your batteries. You don't have a chance to um, uh, rest and relax and get away from it. Sorry, I had a thought. I'm going to hold that for one of the next slides. The ability to say no without feeling guilty um, is, is a crucial skill to staving off uh, burnout and staving off that sense of just overextension um, and learning, being able to do that without feeling bad about it, without succumbing to the pressure. Um, and I like to, when I do this class in person, we do a little practice exercise where we have everybody practicing Thank you for asking, but no, I'm not available. Um, it's a sentence that a lot of us don't perhaps say enough um, or don't feel comfortable saying, but it's a very handy tool. So as an as employee, which of these factors, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, which of these factors are within your control? Most of these are within your realm. Um, as a supervisor, I don't really have a lot to say about your uh, work-life balance, about your bad eating habits, about your lack of close or supportive relationships. The area where I can respond to them is when they manifest themselves in the workplace. Um, if, for example, a person's poor sleep habits mean the person falls asleep at work, then we can talk about that as a performance issue. But that can be an opportunity to talk to someone about, you know, taking care of themselves so that they're ready to work. If in the conversation becomes clear that there are some issues, maybe I can refer them to an employee assistance program. Um, but most of these, I think, fall within the realm of the employee. Uh, it's, it's, it's your life. And it's hard for me to envision a circumstance where I, as a manager, am going to be able to say to somebody, well, you know what? You just can't, you just can't coordinate your high school reunion because it's taking you away from work too much. I can talk about things that are distracting you at work if you're taking a lot of personal phone calls or you're using uh, work resources to work on personal projects. That's a whole other issue. But most of these, um, as supervisors, we don't necessarily have a lot of control over. 
And a lot of times there are things going on in people's life outside of work that we don't know about. So perhaps we can, uh, we can model some of these things. We can model that work-life balance. Um, when, I, when I hear myself say, well, I checked my email from home and blah, 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 I think to myself, well, what am I modeling for my staff here? If I'm telling them, well, I do that, am I sending them a, a message that says, well, I expect you to do that too? And, um, and so part of perhaps the best thing I can do is model appropriate behavior. Some uh, employers um, will sponsor staff wellness programs where you encourage people to go out and go for a walk at work. And some folks will also will try to encourage some kind of fellowship or camaraderie or informal social activities among staff. Um, and those can be some ways to help alleviate some of those things. There are also just personality traits, the way that each one of us is wired that will contribute to burnout. And some of, the, some of those traits I think you've mentioned um, in previous comments, but I'd like to give you a chance to suggest a few more. Um, what are the kinds of personality traits that contribute to burnout? Um, what, just the way that you wired, the way that you look at the world, what are the ideas um, or what are some of those factors that might leave you more susceptible to burning out? Do you have thoughts on that? I know earlier someone mentioned something about delegating um, and I think control, the need to be in control or a uh, reluctance to delegate can certainly be something that will uh, leave one more susceptible to, to burnout. Are there others? Being a perfectionist? Mm -hmm. um, in my family, we used to have an expression that anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And uh, we're trying to get away from that. <laughs> but uh, that tribute, that, that idea that it's got to be perfect. Um, Kate's suggesting the need to please. Um, procrastinator or perfectionist, and those are same, different sides of the same coin, I think. Wanting to contribute to everything. Um, taking on too much and then getting stressed out about it. That sense of, oh man, I should have said no, which is what Jerry has said, I can't say no. People who can't say no. Are there other thoughts? Well, let's look at some of them. Those perfectionist tendencies that need to, it, that 100% is not good enough, that I need to do it, it needs to be done the best, it needs to be done the best ever. Um, and I will, I'll, a little confession here, I'm really prone to this one. Um, and someone introduced me to a, 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 an expression that um, done is better than perfect. Oh, somebody, Yvette has mentioned boundaries. Um, I think that's a really good one to point out. Um, that expression, done is better than perfect, when I first heard that, I thought, what? Um, and I think one of the things that's true is that among people who um, are really prone to being perfectionists, a lot of times their best, what they would, what others might con consider to be really, really good, um, and they would consider, oh, well, that's okay. You know, sometimes we have really extraordinary and perhaps unreasonable expectations about what it should be when it actually could be done. Uh, there's an expression, um, enough is as good as a feast. And I think I actually got that from a children's book. And sometimes let enough just be enough. A need to be in control, um, that, that control need, sometimes uncharitably we'll refer to it as somebody who's a control freak but a reluctance, a reluctance or an unwillingness to delegate to others. And that, I think, relates back to the perfectionism. Um, if I do it myself, I know that it'll be done right. I can't necessarily trust others to do it in a way that will meet my standards. That lets, gets me into a loop because if I can't expect others to do it up to my standards, then it means I have to do it myself. And if I can let go of that, I may be more able to delegate things and let others do it. It's also a way of getting other people involved and to share the workload. Uh, a pervasive pessimism or a negative view of the world. Now, this can be something that actually con is 
occurs after one is feeling somewhat burned out. You start to see the world in a much more negative way. But there are also other people that I'm sure we've all encountered them who not only is the glass half empty, it's an ugly glass. And um, that's the kind of thing that may lead you down a path that helps, that allows you to be more susceptible to feeling burned out. And just that kind of high achieving type A personality, really tightly round, wound, really wanting to do it all. Um, it, it's all that, that it's up to you. Um, a couple of people also had mentioned boundaries and that, that, that need to do it all or the um, wanting to be involved in everything. And some of that relates back, to, I think, to that perfectionism. Um, I have a little sidebar that I've added about societal messages because I think that if we look around us, if you go to the self-help section of your library or you um, just look at advertising on television, there's kind of a pervasive message about achieving excellence sort of success. You can have it all. And, you know, we have models around us of, say, Martha Stewart, who not only has a beautiful home and grows all of her own vegetables and cooks amazing meals and runs a corporation and, um, you know, homeschools her kids if she could and works out six times a week and does it all in high heels. You could look at, you could look at those standards and, and you would constantly feel inadequate because you're not living up to that. Well, no kidding. Um, there are messages, you know, nobody, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try and that you shouldn't have a quality of life, but I'm saying that uh, the desire to, come, to do everything and to have it all and to never have any kind of downtime or never be able to just relax and let go can be the kind of thing that contributes to you feeling burned out. Now, in response to this issue of personality related factors, um, there are some employers, most of them are in the private sector. But there are some employers uh, who use personality testing to gauge what they would call the person-environment fit. Uh, does an employee's disposition and their way of moving through the world fit with that workplace demand or environment? Um, CNN and CareerBuilder have, an art, have done some reports on this, and they're estimating that about 40% of employers use personality assessments to determine if a candidate is suitable for a particular job or a work environment. And they're gauging things like the person's need for stability, uh, their social style, are they solitary or are they gregarious? What is their tolerance for risk or their ability to adapt to change? Their degree of linear thinking. Um, is this someone who um, really needs a stable environment that's never changing? Uh, is it someone who, who is not able to work in an environment where there are a lot of interruptions. This is not something that we necessarily do in, uh, as public employers in, in our libraries, although we may kind of touch on it somewhat in our interviews. Um, but some of these are things that, um, uh, some of these are, are things that they do enter into our ability to move through the world and uh, not get burned out or not get kind of overwhelmed by it. So as an employee, some of these things, a lot of this is just the factors that lie within me. And they may not be the kind of thing that I can easily change unless I really do some intense work and self-evaluation. If I have a high need to be in control, you know, some people would say, um, well, just challenge yourself to do that. Other people would go see a therapist. Other people would read self-help books. Other people might just experiment uh, with trying to let other people do things. As managers or as supervisors, we can respond to how these things manifest themselves in the workplace again. Um, and again, modeling um, appropriate behaviors, appropriate habits, and we can try and model that balance. So what can you do to prevent burnout for yourself and in your work? Um, some of us supervise others, and we've talked about modeling before. Are there ways that we can help others develop patterns, create new habits that will help them be less susceptible to this? And are there things we can do for ourselves? There is a book called The Power of Full Engagement. Um, it's been reprinted a number of times. This Free Press 2004 edition is the latest one. And I think that this is really a lovely analogy for building that kind of resilience to uh, 
avoid burnout is the image of the, the fuel tank. Um, and when we expend energy, we draw down our reservoir. And when we recover it, we fill it back up. If we keep expending it without recovering it, what's going to happen? The car is going to run out of gas. The batteries are going to run down. We have all kinds of analogies for that. But unless you recharge your batteries, unless you refill your tank, unless you renew your psyche, you're at risk. So I'm curious what you think the kinds of things are. What are the kinds of things you can do for yourself? How do you build resilience? How do you refill your own emotional and psychic reservoirs, recharge your batteries? Uh, what kinds of things do you do? How do you relieve stress? How do you regain perspective? Carolyn exercises. What other kinds of things do people do? Read, meditate. Mm -hmm. People do yoga, pray. These are all activities that we take on. One person has said, maybe it sounds awful, but I don't take work too seriously. <laughs> One person says, hit happy hour with friends who work in libraries. And there's a not very thinly veiled hint in there, Jerry. Um, to meet up with friends. You know, sometimes getting together with friends and friends who work in the same environment and just vent, just get it out there because you're with a group of friends who understand the environment. Get away to third places and pace yourself. Okay. Travel. And all of those things are ways of um, Taking a break, getting away. Let's look at some other ones. Minimizing other stress. And Kate has suggested that as a manager, I try to touch base with my staff and check in with them about their stress. And I'm going to ask the same question in just a second from exactly that perspective, Kate, that how can you as a manager or a supervisor or what can you do in the workplace? Um, and for now, let's just talk about <laughs> Julie's going to bake and bring treats to work. Um, there's a, so that she doesn't eat them all. And there's a benefit to that because one is you then don't get yourself into that cycle of, of bad nutritional habits, but it's also a way of kind of providing nurturance uh, to other folks. And uh, Julie, we have some folks who'd like to line up and, and get in line for your, your nurturance and support. Um, some folks escape is, is a, a wonderful way to kind of recharge yourself, refill your, um, refill your reservoir. Some folks do that through reading. Some folks do it through travel. Some folks do it through, someone said, I just allow myself to do nothing. I give myself some downtime. There's a disconnect. Um, a lot of the articles or the books that you'll read will talk about unplugging. They'll say, give yourself a um, computer-free, technology-free um, time period where you're not, your cell phone is turned off, your iPad is turned off, you're not checking email. I think that may be a generational thing. Um, I think that there may be some people for whom that's, that uh, adds stress. Um, so perhaps what, for those folks, what they do is they don't answer their work email. They don't check their, uh, they don't check, uh, their, their library's Facebook page. They do their personal ones. Um, declaring work-free zones and times. Um, for some folks, um, again, you're going to turn off your cell phone. You're not going to check your email. If you pay any attention to the um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, one of their tenets is that you have a day, and I think in their, uh, in their book it's Sundays, where you don't do work things. Um, you, that is your time with your family. If you go to one of their stores, you'll see that they're closed and they have a sign that says, in order for our staff to recharge and spend time with their families and do in those important things outside of work, our store is not open today. That's a pretty revolutionary thought. You own your own stuff, but you don't own other people's. And somebody mentioned earlier about workplace drama and, um, and just not getting sucked into that. Uh, Donna has suggested you may need to disassociate with people who drain your energy. Um, I was at a training recently um, from the uh, Trauma Stewardship Institute, and it was a presentation about um, secondary trauma in uh, people who work with people. And one of the questions she asked is, do you have friends or do you have a caseload? 
and she was talking about the experience that some people have. That if perhaps you're a social worker um, in your work life, and you find out that really all of your friends are are pretty needy, and what you end up doing is the same stuff you do at work, you end up doing at home. And it made me think about you know myself as a librarian and. Um, how often am I like the family librarian or I'm the researcher for family and friends and at what point do I say to them, you know, I would I think it would be a great idea if you called your local library and you and you asked them to help you with that. Um, I know that that's a hard thing for me to do because it's because I love my job and I love doing that, it's hard to say no. But it made me think about things in a slightly different way. Um, some people uh, some people mentioned exercising, meditating and prayer getting in touch with some higher power, with some force that's bigger than yourself. Um, constructive selfishness is what I like to refer to as that downtime, as that having some time for yourself. Um, play. Just have some fun and seek out joy. Breathing, and a couple people mentioned yoga. Um, breath is an important part of yoga, but there's also that physicality to it, the stretching, the moving your body, the... the um, releasing endorphins, um, practice saying no, uh, offering and accepting support. That's very difficult for many of us because, again, going back to those perfectionist tendencies, if I do it myself, I know it'll be done right. If I ask somebody else to do it, eh, I don't know how it's going to go. You can offer and ask for support. And in those cases where you really need some external support, talking to a therapist, using an employee assistance pro program or project if you have one available through your workplace. For other people, it's um, talking to friends. For some people, it's finding support through support groups, um, through uh, just groups at church, um, just finding some, some way of getting creating a support network for yourself. Some folks also uh, talk about starting the day with a relaxation ritual, which for many people, many people who do that with meditation, the first thing they do in the morning. Um, other folks um, start the day by sitting down. You take five or ten minutes um, at the beginning of the day, close your office door, and just kind of write yourself your to-do list to give you a moment to collect yourself, gather your thoughts, and kind of prepare yourself for the day. Well, you can do these things for yourself. But in the workplace, and because many of you are leaders, your supervisors, your managers, what are the kinds of things that you can do for your colleagues and your staff to prevent or alleviate burnout? So are there things you can do for yourself, but are there things you can do for the group? And there's a little irony in this because I've just talked to you about um, cutting back and setting boundaries, and now I'm asking you, yeah, but how are you going to help other people from burning out? Sometimes that's part of our role in work. So what are the kinds of things that you could do as a staff leader or as a supervisor or manager? Um, Kate earlier mentioned, I check in with people, with them about their stresses, and I ask them, how's it going? I check in with them. Keeping the mood light with humor. Ooh, Jerry's mentioned, look people in the eye and listen to them. Pay attention to their nonverbal language, their body language. Pick up those cues. Or other kinds of things you can think of. I talked earlier about modeling appropriate behavior, uh, modeling healthy habits. Merely is suggesting communicating. One of those things that really contributes to burnout is working with unclear expectations. If you can clarify those things for people, you may help alleviate some of the burden. Deal with our own stuff so we're not emotional vampires at work. That's a really powerful phrase. As staff members, we can ask for clarification or help if we need it. We can give feedback about tasks. Sometimes people are afraid to ask for clarification. Uh, they don't want to be perceived as dumb. They don't want to be perceived as, as obstructionist. Um, Someone has mentioned that when you ask somebody to take on a new task, see if they need to give up something. What do they need to, what do they need to get rid of? Um, that's a very powerful statement. And by introducing that, you then give them permission to let go of something. 
collaborating with others, um, finding ways to keep perspective. Um, again, some of those uh, personality tasks that we talked about earlier, don't take it personally. And there is sometimes just a need to practice some forgiveness. Um, sometimes we, in environments where we have people who have worked for a long time, worked in the same place for a long time, we sometimes, some people will harbor old grievances. Um, well, 10 years ago we did this and it didn't work and I'm still mad at that person or I don't trust that person. Um, sometimes they're just, there can be a, just a purging of those, you forgive those old sins and just, you know, there's an expression, bless it and release it, just let it go, um, start over. And don't take things personally. Uh, adopting an idea that, as I said, done is better than perfect. And because some of us are supervisors or managers, we can help our staff by providing clear job descriptions and directions. Some of you have given some really good um, examples of if I assign a new task, ask, what can we take off your plate? Can we send this to someone else? And that's part of that establishing some realistic expectations. Um, diversifying tasks, giving feedback and recognition. Now, challenge for you, if any of you are supervisors or middle managers, it may be that you've been, you've not been given clear direction. You've not been given, given um, a clear description and you have to try and figure that out. And this is the peril, certainly, of middle management. And one of the things that you may be also trying to do is imbalance employee well-being with the fact that we have work to do and we have deadlines we need to meet. Um, and so we do sometimes need to put pressure on people to produce. Um, if I only have two people and I have ten tasks that need to be done, okay, we, if we have to get all those things done, uh, one of the things we might be able to do is say, really? Do we really have to get all those things done? Uh, but figure out some ways to um, divide things up easily. Um, I notice that some people are leaving the room. We are approaching our hour time, which is um, a time when many mm -hmm. people have to leave to go on a desk or something. So I was just going to say, uh -huh. are you going to be within a few moments of yes. uh, being done. Okay, just want to kind of give that high. And then people, if you can stay, please uh, stay. And, and I hope Deborah will be able to take questions for a few minutes afterwards. I will be. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, what if you're already aflame? Your coattails are smoking. You're already feeling that, that, that sense of heaviness, that lack of spark. This is not something to take lightly. Um, it's not something to just shrug off. Um, burnout's really serious. Um, it can affect all aspects of your life. And one of the things people need to do is step back and get some perspective um, to seriously reevaluate your goals and priorities um, and be brutally honest. Um, you know, the worst case scenario is somebody's going to decide, you know what, I can't do this work anymore. I'm going to need to do something else. Well, in this economy, in this environment, that's a really difficult thing to do. So are there some things you can do short of that? Um, you may need to acknowledge the losses that you felt. Sometimes it means the sense of why did you get into this field? I, used to, I became a librarian or I started to work in libraries because of this, but we don't do that anymore. You can grieve that loss and let it, let it go. Um, there may be something that used to be really the, the, the most joyful part of your work that you don't do anymore. Well, the question I would ask is, can you find that joy in some other task? Can you find that sense of pleasure? Is there some other aspect of your work that can give you joy? If you used to enjoy working with children in story time and seeing the joy in their face, can you get that same joy by mentoring other staff, by working with newer employees? Can you get that same level of satisfaction? Is there some way to rechannel that desire into another activity? Um, it is important to, uh, oftentimes the people who are most susceptible to burnout may be the people who have the highest vacation balances. And we mentioned earlier escaping, uh, needing to step away. Um, and sometimes it's important just to talk to somebody, as we talked about therapists, supervisors. It's okay to admit that, you know, I'm feeling a little fried about this. Um, and to start talking about that, have a conversation about it. But taking some action because one of the aspects of burnout that's so overwhelming is the sense of no control. 
and in regaining some aspect of control that can be very empowering. And calling in your 911, the folks who um, can help you, the folks who can be supportive to you. Okay. And what I'd like to ask you to do is if you are, um, if based on the things we talked about today, let's actually go ahead and make a contract with ourselves. Um, there is a handout that will pop up here in just a second that's actually, um, I call it, it's a contract with myself. And what I'd like you to do is now or later, go ahead and print it out and commit to yourself in writing two things you will do to take care of yourself. Just pick two. Everybody can pick two. And commit to one thing that you will do to help alleviate burnout in your workplace. What's one thing you can do to be helpful in your workplace? Just one thing. Now, if we were doing this in person, I would collect these from you and I would mail them back to you in two weeks. But based on the webinar, what I'm going to ask you to do is fold up that paper and tuck it away someplace. Put it in a safe place, not so safe that you're going to lose it, but just tuck it away. And then pull it out again in about two weeks to remind yourself um, what you are going to do. In writing it down, thinking about it, that's a good start. Writing it down reinforces it. Reading it again in a couple of weeks will help reinforce it even more and may be the kind of thing that goads you to action. Okay. I know that we are up against the end of our time, so let's just kind of wrap up what we did cover. We talked about differences between burnout and stress. And we talked about symptoms and stages of burnout. Um, we talked about, and you all contributed wonderful thoughts about personal workplace and societal factors that contribute to burnout. And you also came up with some uh, very helpful ideas and tips for each other to stop or prevent burnout. And our very last activity uh, was to actually doc write down for ourselves some concrete steps that we will take. Now you do, there is a supplemental reading package um, that will pop up at some point here. And it includes um, three articles, uh, all from very different perspectives. One is from uh, James Messina, who's a, a physician with the Livestrong Foundation. Um, his article is uh, pretty take no prisoners. He's got a pretty blunt approach. But I think his insights and some of his exercises are worth reading. Um, he has, I think there's a real strength in his article about uh, how to create solutions. He has an exercise about that. The second article uses a, a metaphor of going through life as a sprinter versus a marathoner. He uses a running metaphor. And then the third one is by a woman named Christine Martin. And it's specifically about burnout in libraries. And it takes some of these concepts and applies them in a library environment. And I think it, um, it applies much of what we've talked about here. And some, sometimes it's nice to have that in print um, and to have that to refer to later. So I'm um, wondering now if you have questions or comments or anything that you want to share for the good of the order, for those of you who are able to stay. You can if you wish. If you have a, a microphone headset, we'll be happy to um, you know, entertain any questions. Or you can type them in chat, whichever you feel more comfortable with. And we want to thank um, Deborah. Thank you so much for sharing this. As you can tell, we got a good turnout. Um, lots of folks here. And of course, more people will probably access it as we go on down the line. So lots of people saying thanks. And I'm not seeing, let's see. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, but uh, that may be just because you did such a great job of covering okay. the waterfront. <laughs> well, I appreciate all of your contributions and the thoughts that, that you all brought to it. I think that we all have ideas to contribute and ways to help each other, but sometimes it's nice. A couple of you mentioned get, get together with others, other like-minded individuals, and this is certainly one way to do it. Um, I guess what I would add as kind of our last thought is a quote from Miguel Cervantes um, about the phoenix hope who can wing her way through the desert skies and defying fortune's spite, revive from ashes and rise. And that would be my hope for you is that um, 
at like the phoenix, we may flirt with the frames, but we are not consumed by them, or if we are consumed by them, but there is a way that we can um, help ourselves recover and revitalize and um, revive and rise and continue to do the good work that we do. So I appreciate you being here this morning, and I appreciate all the thoughts you contributed. Well, thank you. We appreciate that, and I hope that many of you will join us, uh, might be interested in our next topic, which is um, how do you build support in the community for business reference? And that's next, um, next first Tuesday's topic in February. So again, thank you. Um, I really hope to see you, and um, I love that last quote. That's great. That is a lovely one. Any other, any questions? Um, looks like someone's typing, so we'll see if Julie, what Julie is saying. And Julie says thank you. So I guess, um, seeing no, no one else typing, I guess I'll say thank you very much to everyone. And um, Jeremy, when will the um, this be up? Uh, especially since we.